funny. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. We'll give everybody just a little bit more time to, to get logged on. Egypt. Did yes. You, did you get my um, email 15 minutes ago? Oh, no, I did not yet. I haven't checked it. How are you doing, Barbara? I'm <laughs> so doing good to see fine. You. I have a question for the whole group. It's a conundrum. Yeah, of course. When, when it's appropriate. Absolutely. Absolutely. Love your shirt. So pretty. Thanks. <laughs> How was your summer? Oh, it was really good. It was really yeah. good. Yours? Yeah, it, was good. it was good. Um, busy. Um, but it was it was well. It was well. Yeah. Girls were you had a great time. Much? Were, were you up in yeah. Boston? Yeah. For the majority of the summer, um, June I was there. Um, wasn't there in July and not in August. But I'll be back later on in the month and of course I'll be there October in, in November. I'd like to get together. Oh, absolutely. We definitely will. Okay, let's see. I'll give it just a few more minutes. I see a couple more people logging in now. So good to see so many faces returning. Okay. All right, well, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Egypt Lloyd, um, and along with members of my family, the Lloyd family, um, we founded the Slave Legacy History Coalition, um, for those that do not know. Um, and the purpose of our coalition is to um, have monthly virtual meetings and um, to provide an easier access to information and resources on the legacy of slavery before and after emancipation to the families of slave descendants and the general public. And we meet uh, once a month on the second Wednesday of every month starting at 1030 a.m. I'm very excited about today's presenter, but before I introduce our presenter for today, I would like to uh, turn it over to Naomi, um, who's an intern with us uh, by uh, the support of the Longfellow House, and she will be giving you the announcements and updates. So Naomi, I will turn it over to you. Hi, good morning, everyone, welcome. Um, um, welcome, especially for folks uh, joining us for the first time. Um, we are excited to have Sarah as our presenter today, um, but I also wanted to give folks a rundown of um, our future presenters for the fall. Um, and also, as I'm doing the announcements, if anybody's joining for the first time, um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat. Um, yeah, so for the fall lineup, in October, we have Christian Walk from Museum of African American History, Boston, Nantucket. November, we have the American Folk Art Museum. December, Shirley Eustis House. And then January, we have Old North. And I believe Nikki Stewart, um, who is the executive director of Old North, is actually joining us um, today for the first time. Um, and then for the announcement, on October 20th, Dennis in Egypt um, and Julia Royal will be speaking at the Harvard Club of New York um, about, so the three of them met in this past March, and they'll be talking about the impact of that meeting. Um, and then um, since January, Old North is going to be our presenter, I do encourage you guys to go see um, a play that they're putting on. It's called Revolution's Edge. And the last show will be September 19th, so coming up very soon. 
Um, I did go see it, it was great. So encourage folks to go check that out. Um, and then over the summer, uh, this new slavery in Boston exhibit opened at Benwell Hall, which was co-curated by Kara Singleton, who was our most recent presenter. I think that's it for announcements, but if folks have any other announcements to put in our newsletter or the next meeting, um, you can email us at info at slavelegacyhistorycoalition.org, which I will drop in the chat. Okay, um, and then I'm gonna turn it back over to each other. Great, thank you, Naomi, um, I appreciate that. Um, Yes, and at the end of our presenter, um, who I will announce in just a second, there will be an opportunity for everyone to do a Q&A. So I encourage everyone um, to enter their questions in the chat, and we will try and get to as many questions as we can do. Um, we want to um, keep our meeting to an hour today, but... Um, Sarah, our presenter, is so grateful that if we have any additional questions that we cannot get to, I will get those answers um, emailed to you at a later time. So, um, like I said, today I'm very honored and excited about our presenter, uh, Sarah uh, Bleach. She's the vice provost for special projects at Harvard University. And she... Um, was able to uh, bless us today with giving her her time. And she's going to talk about, give us the update on Harvard and the Legacy Slavery Initiative that's going on. There's been a lot of updates and she is here to give us that update. Um, and I'm also going to encourage everyone in the chat to please give Sarah a happy birthday. Today is her birthday and um, I, I'm just so honored that she will share her time on this blessed day. So um, with all that, I will turn over to Sarah and welcome and happy birthday to you again, Sarah. Thank you so much, Egypt. It's great to be with all of you and see some familiar faces. I talked with Egypt and her dad back in the spring about the opportunity to come and speak with you all. And I have really been looking forward to it, both for the chance to share a bit about what we're doing with the Harvard and Legacy Slavery Initiative, but then to hear your feedback. So I want to sort of give you maybe 20 minutes or so of an overview, but then I would just love to hear your thoughts. Thank you all for the very kind birthday wishes. Um, and just hear, you know, some of your feedback, um, what you're hearing from your communities, suggestions that you have for us, any thoughts. So let me go ahead and share my screen. And before I do, I do just want to acknowledge that on the call is um, Chrissy, who I think probably is the last person who presented about carbon legacy of slavery about a year ago. So I'm happy to be able to give you this update now. So let me share my screen. Can you all see that? Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. So let me just start with a little bit of background about how Harvard got to the place it's at now in terms of being really interested in understanding our legacy of slavery. So this pulling at this thread began back in the early 2000s. There's a faculty member in arts and sciences, his name is Sven Beckert, and he taught an undergraduate course on legacy of slavery. Incidentally, he was inspired by the president of Brown University at the time, Dr. Ruth Simmons, who you might know just had a book come out um, about a sort of her own memoirs. He was inspired by her and the work that she was doing at Brown University. And as you might recall, she was the first president of an Ivy League university to explore, uh, explore universities' entanglements with slavery. So then fast forward, then President Drew Faust picked up the, the question and she assigned a committee to continue to explore the university's entanglements with slavery. And then it was President Larry Bacow who was a close, is a close personal friend of Dr. Ruth Simmons, uh -huh. who then commissioned the report, which was led by Dean Tamiko Brown Nagin, which resulted in the Harvard and the Legacy of Slavery report. So it's really been about a 15 year long journey for the university to get to this point, to have this book that come out. And hopefully you all have had a chance to, to read it. I just wanna take a moment and give you the key top lines that you need to know about the report. 
And I will say, and we'll put it in the chat, we have created a short two pager, which basically summarizes these top lines, the HNLS initiative, Harvard Legacy Slavery Initiative, because what we find is that number one, there's a whole lot of folks out there that have no idea that Harvard has done this work. There are also a lot of folks that are aware of it, but they don't really understand what the takeaways are. So we tried to distill it down into the sort of 30 second or 60 second version. Your help in just pushing out that two pager to folks that you think might be interested would be really useful because we are, as we continue with the implementation work that I'm gonna talk about, one significant thing that we have to continue to always do is just educate the public about what we're trying to do and what we're trying to accomplish. So in terms of those big takeaways, the first is that Harvard has direct ties to slavery. Harvard leaders, faculty, and staff enslaved more than 70 people that we know of in the 17th and 18th centuries. Take home point number two is Harvard has financial ties to slavery. So five men who made their fortune in slavery and slave produced goods contributed more than one third of all private donations to the university in the first half of the 19th century. And the third key takeaway is intellectual ties. So in the 19th and the 20th century, faculty at Harvard did race science, did work around eugenics, ideas that have since been debunked, but they underpinned Jim Crow segregation. They continue to support white supremacy. And these are ideas that remain very entrenched in society. Now, the other thing the report did, in addition to unveiling these very difficult truths, is it highlights important examples of resistance. Black students at the time who said, no, you can't kick me out of a dorm because I'm black. No, you cannot kick me off the football team. So the report includes a lot of good examples like that. And I do wanna again, call out Chrissy because she was such an integral person who worked on the development of this report. I personally have been in this role since January. So she far predates me. So a reasonable question is, okay, well, where is the university trying to go now that the report has, has been put out? There are two big things that we are pushing toward. One is we wanna change Harvard. We wanna turn us into an institution who is accountable for our past and is active in thinking about how do we do meaningful repair? And I'll be very transparent and say, the answers at this point are not totally knowable. This is where conversations like this are very helpful. We're doing a lot of community engagement, which I'll talk about because what we don't wanna do is presuppose the answers. What we want to instead do is to listen hard and to hear where the opportunities are and to figure out how we can make that work with who we are, which is an institution of higher learning. And then a second really important piece is how do we engage direct descendants of those who were enslaved by Harvard personnel? And then how do we more broadly engage descendant communities? So I just wanna give you a quick sense of what are the core values that are driving this work. And you can see those listed here. These are also on our website, which we can put in the chat. Just a point of clarification, there's the Legacy of Slavery Report, which has a website. And then separate and apart from that, we have a website which is focused on the implementation piece, which is what we're gonna talk mostly about today. And so you, they, they cross link to each other, but if you're looking for information, you have to sort of go to different places to find it. But these are the core values listed here that are really guiding us in all the work that we are doing. And of course, the first one is our motto here at Harvard, which is Veritas. And it is something that really drove and inspired the report. And it's something that we take very, very seriously in all the work that we are doing. I wanna give you a sense of the people that are behind the work. This is just the leadership team. We are building up a really strong team of folks to create the institutional muscle to get this work done. And so I just wanna give you a quick snapshot of some of the folks that are really helping to drive this from a leadership perspective. So that's me on the left. Next to me is Roshana Moore Evans. She's the executive director of the initiative. She comes from Boston. She has a background at the, her latest job before coming here was at the Broad Institute. She has deep passion about how do we take this work and bring it to life and has been really critical in spearheading a lot of the community engagement work that I'm gonna to talk to you about. Next to her is Martha Minow. She's the former Dean at the law school. She also was the, she was the chair of the implementation committee that was initially put in place 
to help bring the report to life. Um, that committee is um, since been disbanded and we're standing up um, a new group, but she is a amazing, and I can't underscore amazing enough. She's an amazing thought partner and has really been helpful as we are thinking through the various pieces. Next to her is Richard Cellini. He is the executive director of the Harvard Slavery Remembrance Program. That is the portion of the portfolio which is identifying direct descendants of those enslaved by Harvard leaders, faculty, and staff. It is extremely meticulous work and he's doing it in partnership with the New England Historical Genealogical Association. And he comes to Harvard from Georgetown where he led the Memory Project. Many of you may be familiar with that. That was the project which was tracing the descendants of the 272 individuals who were enslaved by Georgetown. And then next to him is Dr. Ruth Simmons. We are extremely fortunate that she, the woman who really has inspired a lot of this work here at Harvard, inspired the very first professor to begin exploring this issue. She joined our university on July 1st as a senior advisor to our new president, Claudine Gay. And she is specifically focused on HBCU engagement, so historically black colleges and universities. And she is really helping us to think through that portion of the portfolio. So I wanted to say a word about who I am and what brings me to this work. So um, the picture on the left is, um, I'm the one on the far, far left. That's um, myself, my brother, and my twin sister. We are, this picture was taken in Baltimore City, which is where we are from. My parents live in a house that's about a mile and a half from here. If you've been to Baltimore, this is the, what used to be the stadium where the Orioles play, who by the way, are having a fantastic season this year. Um, now it has um, been changed and it's something else, but this is where I learned how to ride a bike. And, um, and I grew up in a neighborhood that was working class it's in the inner city part of Baltimore. And I remember being a kid and I remember looking around and asking myself, why, why are things different for certain kids in this area? My parents would take me to the library every weekend or to the aquarium and do all this kind of stuff. But every kid, it wasn't the same. And, you know, as I've gotten older and I've, I've learned a lot more about the world, what I have come to realize is that when you look around, there's so much talent everywhere, but what you don't see is opportunity. And so one of the things that is driving this work for me personally is, you know, how do you create meaningful opportunities to really try to tap into this broad talent around the country, which often isn't fully leveraged? And then on the right is R, my girls. So um, the little one is just now a two digit number as of June. And then, so she's 10. And then on the right is my oldest and she's 12. And to Egypt's point about today being my birthday, I have very festive children. So this morning I opened the door to my office. I had a dinner with friends last night. I opened the door to my office and there are streamers everywhere, the balloons everywhere. There's a birthday crown. And there's another, so that was this morning. There's another room in the house, which has a closed door for tonight. And so we'll just have to wait and see what's behind door number two. Um, but, you know, for me, they are a huge part of my inspiration because, you know, they are spirited young women who drive me crazy at times, but they are, you know, they love life and they're enthusiastic, but it's also the case that the world may treat them differently because of how they look. That's not right, but it is a matter of fact. And so how do we use this work that we are all so passionate about to push us towards a world where people don't get treated differently? And so that's another thing that really inspires me every day. As I look at them, I look at their friends, I look at the, you know, the folks when I drive to school and I just ask myself, how do I do my small part to try to help all these kids live a better life and maximize their full potential? So in terms of you know, the big rocks that we are trying to move. The report is organized around seven recommendations, but I, I find it's hard to commit them to memory. So I just wanna talk about them thematically. What we are trying to do first and foremost is, do where, is leverage the areas where we are strong, education, research, scholarship, our ability to partner with others, to advance opportunities right here in our backyard in Harvard and Cambridge, and then much farther beyond. How do we strengthen our relationships with HBCUs? We have across the university dozens of examples of how Harvard partners with HBCUs. Some of them incidentally date back decades. How do we do that more systematically? How do we think about you know, a whole set of universities which have been historically under-resourced, but which produce 
some of the most talented black professionals in the country. How do we think about enriching those partnerships in ways that are meaningful? How do we, as I already mentioned, identify, but then engage with direct descendants of those who were enslaved by Harvard personnel? Another key piece of this is building a physical memorial on Harvard's campus to honor those who were enslaved and to think more and to create a space to think about how do we make sure this doesn't happen in the future? And then how do we ensure institutional accountability for this work? I wanna make two points about this. The first is that as you're well aware, the university has committed an endowment of $100 million to support this work. And the endowment was intentional to support the work in perpetuity. The key thing to know is that the vast majority of that $100 million is intended to be pushed out the door. In other words, we're not trying to pay ourselves. We are trying to push the work out programmatically to really try to meet the mission and goals of Harvard and the legacy of slavery. The second key thing to know is that because of that posture towards spending, we have a separate budget, a separate operational budget, which is where my salary comes from, the whole HNLS team, and just you know the space that we rent and so on and so forth. And so we've really intentionally divided those things so that the maximum resources can go towards the communities and the people that we are trying to reach. I wanna just give you a snapshot of some of the things that we can look to to show progress. And I wanna emphasize and foot stomp on the fact that we are really just getting started. There is so much to do in terms of, as I mentioned, engaging the right people, getting ideas, hearing feedback. And there's also a lot of work to do within the Harvard community to do the same. But just some of the things that I can point to are a set of, for example, curricular resources that have been developed by Mira Levinson. She's a faculty member at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. These are materials that help teach about and talk about slavery and, and the book itself. And so if you are interested in a book club or if you have people that might appreciate these, these um, tangential materials to the report, I encourage you to have a look at them and see how you might leverage them, how you might disseminate them. We also um, have the Memorial Project Committee, um, which is the group of people who are helping to think through how do we actually stand up this memorial, which will take several years um, to actually come to life, but will probably be one of the most significant art projects on the campus in the last hundred years. So lots of excitement about that. We last spring launched what is called the HBCU Digital Library Trust. That is a partnership between the Harvard Library and the HBCU Digital Library Alliance with the goal of taking archival content, digitizing it, and making it publicly available for free. I think we can all agree that there's tons of important content that's just not available in the online space. So the purpose of this, of this partnership is to really think through how do we work together to make this information available to everyone. We do, as I mentioned, have a website which you can um, keep an eye on to stay up to date on everything that we're doing. Um, and then just again, a key piece of this is, you know, we are creating a team that actually can do this work and everyone who was on the team and everyone who will be on the team, our roles did not exist eight months ago. All of this is brand new. And so we're learning as we go. I'm sure that we'll make some mistakes, but what I can assure you is that everyone on this team is deeply passionate about trying to do this work right. One of the things that President Backhouse said when the report was first released is that he really wanted schools and units around the university to lean in. And so here are just some examples of things that we are seeing around the university. So lots of different schools have created space for folks to discuss the report. There is a film, which if you haven't seen it, we can put the link in the chat. It's a 23 minute film, which is um, sort of a footnote version of the report. Um, there have been screenings for the film and there have been a number of schools that have launched lectures or lecture series. And we also have the HNLS tour, which Dan Smith, who's on the call, is instrumental in. And that's another thing that a lot of schools have leveraged to educate their communities about this work. But then at the same time, what we're seeing is a lot of creativity. So some schools have made HNLS a permanent part of their orientation materials. Some schools have created courses um, which bring in HNLS or, or exclusively focus on HNLS. Um, and then there are others who are thinking about how do we create exchange programs? for professors or students at HBCU programs um, to either come to Harvard or for us to go there. So lots of different interesting things happening. I wanna talk a little bit about our community engagement, which um, is something that 
we are doing very deliberately. And again, this is this whole effort is really being led by Roshana Moore Evans, who is the executive director. What you can see here are just some of the key things that we are trying to do in terms of the ways that we are trying to reach out to different, oh, sorry about that, different members of the community. I'm trying to move this Zoom box. There we go, get it out of the way. Um, but as you can see, you know, we're doing a lot of outreach. We're doing a lot of consultation. We are trying to figure out ways to involve community members in ways that are meaningful and looking for ways to co-create content. And then how do we empower the communities that we are trying to reach to really help own this work and to push it forward? You know, there are 90 universities around the country that are asking some question related to, you know, what, is, what are our entanglements? What is our complicity in slavery? There are about 4,000 colleges and universities across the entire country, of which about 1,000 were founded before 1865, meaning they were founded before the legal end of slavery. If universities keep thinking about ways that they can engage, if the number keeps growing, it makes the group of people that are working on this effort that much bigger. But it's so important that agency around big decisions and how we engage with direct descendants, how we engage with descendant communities, it is so important that these are not top-down solutions, but that we actually talk to people and we hear where the opportunities are, and we don't presuppose the answers. Here are some examples of different ways by sector that we have done community engagement. I won't go through this in any detail, but I will say that if there are groups that you think that it'd be helpful for us to talk to, to hear from, I really encourage you to reach out and let us know. You can reach out to me individually, or you can reach out to the Legacy of Slavery email address, which we'll put in the chat. Um, but we are really interested in hearing from you about different ways that we can help talk to people as a way of bringing this work to life. I do just want to flag that none of this is happening in a vacuum. So obviously at the beginning of the summer, there were some major SCOTUS decisions that came down. One of them is affirmative action, which upended decades of precedent around admissions to college. Another is student debt relief. And so when you put those two things together, they are creating really big ripple effects that can hurt young people. And so when you think about just applying to college, young people are gonna be hurt by the affirmative action decision. When you look at student debt relief and you sort of pull back the veil and look at the details, you know, the average person owes $56,000. These are black borrowers who had the highest level of student debt. The average black borrower owes $56,000. 25% of whom are behind on their payments. Now, separate and apart from this decision, the president has been working on creating another alternative lane for student debt relief. But these are, these are changes in our national landscape that are gonna really drive decisions around higher education. And so we have to think about, you know, does that help fuel this work and make it even more important? And hopefully it gets other people to try to lean in and think about, you know, how do we as institutions of higher learning really create space and create the diversity which we know that they require and need. So just in terms of you know how you can stay engaged with us, again, I will just foot stomp on the point that please go to our website. It's going to keep you up to date on what we're doing. I mentioned the point about you know sending out the two pager, sharing the case studies that Professor Levinson developed, sharing the film to serve as ambassadors of this work. It is striking to me as I have the opportunity to speak with different groups, how many folks are completely unaware of this effort? And it's no one's fault. We are being inundated with information all the time. So we are just trying to do our best to push it out there. To the extent to which you can share information with your networks, we would be deeply appreciative. Now coming up this fall, we will be releasing a request for proposals. This is gonna be the first time that we are seeking people to apply for grants to help support the mission, the goals, the values of HNLS. A requirement of the RFP, which will be released sometime in the fall semester, I don't have an exact date, is that members of the Harvard community will have to partner with, with community-based organizations with preference given to the Boston and Cambridge areas. So stay tuned for that. We are really excited to sort of see what bubbles up There'll be opportunities for bigger grant opportunities and smaller grants. And then finally, you know, reach out to us as you have good ideas. Again, if there are groups with whom you think we should be talking, please do let us know. You know, I just want to 
I look forward to hearing your thoughts and just a few closing reflections from me is, you know, this is not easy. I have spent most of my career in food nutrition policy, and this is not that. That sort of is everyone's happy and, you know, the answers, the answers are pretty clear. In this work, it's emotionally challenging. We are building the, fl the plane while we fly it. But going back to this point about, you know, all the universities in the country, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity with this initiative, if we do it right, to not just serve those who we are trying to meet, but to inspire other colleges and universities to do the same. Imagine if others stepped up and didn't just explore their complicity, but made financial investments. This can help impact people's lives in real ways. And what I have observed, you know, being in this post for about seven months is that when you look around, when you look around within the Harvard community and outside the Harvard community, this work has really unlocked enormous creativity. And I think that's exciting. And we just have to harness that because the biggest danger I think that we face is that we lose momentum, not because people aren't excited and interested, in, but attention just naturally wanes. People have other things to do. They have other priorities. And so we have to think very strategically about one, how do we embed this work in our DNA at Harvard? How do we make this part of our everyday operations? And then in the broader communities, how do we help think about partnerships and opportunities to, to really think about how to make this work real and sustainable and meaningful? So very much appreciate your time today. Really look forward to your questions. And wanna again, thank Egypt and her father for their leadership and for inviting me to have a chance to come talk to you today. Thank you. Oh, I think you're muted, Egypt. Oh, sorry about that, everyone. Thank you, Sarah, for a very informative meeting. It was very uh, great of you to, to share that with us. Right now, I will uh, turn it over to Naomi to ask a few questions to Sarah. Naomi? Yes, let me look into the chat. I mean, I actually have a question um, regarding the affirmative action decision by SCOTUS. I think I saw that Harvard did put out a statement um, about the decision. But I guess I was wondering how is Harvard navigating that and is the legacy of slavery, are you guys also like, um, like, what are your efforts towards that as well? That's, I guess that's my question. Yeah, that's a great question. So yes, um, President Gay, who is our new president, did issue a statement about the affirmative action case. And essentially what she said is, we will follow the law. However, we will also stay true to our values as a university, one of which is the importance of diversity across our student body. So we, like every university and college around the country, is asking ourselves, what does that look like? What form does it take? And it's immediate. So this is going to affect admissions, you know, in the fall cycle. I think the honest answer is, you know, the universities are still thinking through exactly what are the right steps and how to actually um, how to actually implement the decision, which frankly has a lot of gray in it. And I I was talking to a legal scholar recently and what that person said to me is that it will we will likely figure out exactly what the path is through future litigation because of the gray that's in the current decision. So it's a great question. From my perspective, I think what it does is it just makes the work of the Harvard Legacy of Slavery that much more important as we think about, you know, both the fact that Harvard has invested in this area and is and has made it a big priority. But just in terms, again, as universities around the country are looking for ways to help young people, there are a lot of different ways to do that. And we hope that the work that we are doing here serves as guideposts to other people. Barbara. And you're muted. I heard and I'm delighted about your focus on the Boston area. And I'm wondering um, 
what I see in the Boston area, I've been doing this work for 17 years um, at Hidden Brookline, um, bringing to light the hidden history of slavery and freedom, is that um, we haven't gotten very deep. We haven't affected the majority of people. We haven't affected the majority of towns in the Boston area who have not yet done uh, research on slavery and, um, and the legacy of slavery. So I'm wondering if there is a way that Harvard could call a conference of leaders from each one of the towns in the Boston area um, to share, to talk about how to deepen communities understanding. Brookline people only began to understand that there was slavery in Brookline and there was a lot of it. We had six slave traders as well when um, people demanded to change the name of a school because it was named after a slave trader. My God, a slave trader in, Brook sl in slavery in Brookline, that's not possible. And so forth and so on. Um, when we changed the name of a second school, it was a whole lot easier because the knowledge was there. So my, my question and my hope is that we convene a conference to bring people from different towns together and we provide an incentive for them to come. Maybe it's the name Harvard, maybe it's more than that. And then we help them do the research as well as public education. Because if we do not do the research and the public education, we will have, as we already are having in Boston, and I know that um, from Boston teachers, we are having blowback. People are afraid to teach this material uh, in the schools. And if it's not taught to the K to 12 students in Massachusetts, then we will have lost an incredible opportunity Thank you so, so much. I, there's yeah. one other thing that Ed School might call a conference for superintendents in the Boston area. Hmm. You're, it's a suggestion or it's something that you think is in the works? No, I think this is important to do. And I'd be happy to talk further. This yeah, no, I appreciate so important. I appreciate those suggestions. I have to say, Barbara, that I've heard your name many times, um, but we've never had the opportunity to meet. So it's very nice to um, have a chance to both meet you and hear your thoughts. I do wanna say one thing about something that is underway to help the public with history. So um, I believe Professor Evelyn Higginbotham is on the line who, um, as you may know, she's a professor at Harvard in African-American studies and she is, and, his, and history. And she is going to be leading our flagship course that's going to be online for HNLS, which is focused on public engagement with history. The idea behind the course is that, number one, you have fewer people going into fields of history just because of slots and pay and other things. You have um, students who are not necessarily are going into that field either, but you have this enormous public interest in understanding history, particularly outside of traditional channels that sit outside the ivory tower. And so what this course is hoping to do is to really teach people about how do you do that public engagement in history and how do you do it um, you know, without necessarily having to be in a fancy school, but how do you actually leverage resources that are available? And so it's very much in early stages, but we completely agree with you that we don't wanna squash people's curiosity, rather we wanna help them, people who are inspired to look back, we wanna help them with the tools for how they might go about doing it. I see some questions in the chat, so maybe I can, um, if it's okay, Naomi, I can read some and then answer them. Um, yeah. uh, yes, of course, yeah, go ahead, Sarah. Okay, um, so one question um, um, is about HBCU libraries, so is, and it's about the Digital Library Trust that we talked about. So the question is, is this to make Harvard's archives available to HBCUs or are you digitizing the archives of HBCUs and make them available to the public? Excellent question and my apologies for not being clear. It's the latter. So this has nothing to do with Harvard's collections. This is us at Harvard partnering with HBCUs to help them put their content online. 
Um, and so we're really, really excited about it. And, um, and it's a true partnership. Um, it's not that it's not that the expertise doesn't exist. It's just a matter of resources to get it done. And so we're trying to be helpful in that capacity. And in fact, the program manager um, for the project will be a Harvard employee, but that person will sit down at Clark Atlanta um, to help with the implementation of the project. So we're super excited about it. So thank you for that question, Ladada. Did that answer it? Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Paula, for the kind words. Um, thinking of conferences. Oh, so this is an announcement from Scarlett about the Northern Slavery Collective Conference that will take place February 5th in New York City. Question from David is, is Harvard doing anything to reach the elementary age students in our community who suffer from the ripple effects of slavery and what took place at Harvard? Great question. So another funded project which is underway is helping K through 12 educators, creating materials to help K through 12 educators educate students on some on issues around slavery. And so we know that we are at a time nationally where questions about race are being restricted in some schools. And so it's really important to think about how can we help educators consistent with you know the, the district with, with, within which they live, but how can we help educators have tools to teach students? So it's a, it's a great question and it's just a start because there's a lot of interesting things in the K through 12 space um, that could bring benefit. Does that answer your question, David? Yes, okay, awesome. Um, and then you see that um, Professor Higginbotham um, mentioned that I did an okay job describing her course. So I'm glad to have her green light on that. Um, from uh, Robert Bellinger, so Barbara Brown makes a good point. While Harvard is beginning this work, this work has been going on in local communities, cities for some time. However, they do not have the resources and high visibility of Harvard. Will Harvard be willing to partner with these communities without feeling the need to be the leader expert in a way that diminishes their agency? Excellent question. So, um, and it's a point that I should have led with, which is you're absolutely right, that we are very late to the game when it comes to thinking about our entanglements with slavery. So again, there are dozens and dozens of other universities which have gone down this path. And to your point, Mr. Bellinger, there are many, many community groups that have been doing this work for a long time from whom we can learn a lot. And so, so the answer, the short answer to your question is yes, we are very willing to partner with community groups. And in fact, you know, one of the concrete ways that that will be possible this school year is through that RFP that I mentioned, because a requirement for us to give funding, a requirement is that the there is a community group which partners with someone within Harvard. And so, and again, we are not paying ourselves. So we are really looking for great ideas that advance the mission of HLS, um, but they're really supporting the Boston and the Cambridge communities. And I should add that the RFP is really meant to get people thinking big. As you all well know, the corrosive impacts of slavery impact every aspect of American life. So transportation, housing, healthcare, criminal justice, education, and so, you know, people that are applying to this can cover the waterfront and be really thinking creatively about how do I take an existing program and make it better? How do I stand up a new program and then hopefully, you know, sustain it over time? So we personally on, on the HNLS side are just really excited to see what sort of ideas come up because, you know, to your point, Robert, so many folks have been working in this space, there's gonna be a lot of great ideas that will come up that we look forward to funding. Does that answer your question? Um, it does, but it still leaves uh, my concern about um, groups that are not as powerful or well known as Harvard working with Harvard. My experience in the past has been that even when Harvard's been invited to join initiatives going on, they come in and with the attitude of, OK, well, here's what we're going to do, regardless of what's being done. And also, uh, many of these communities don't have the kind of resources that they need. Um, but work, as Barbara Brown has said, been going on in Arlington and Cambridge, in um, Lexington, where I live, and other places. And, um, you know, for instance, I, I've known that um, Harvard had a class of students um, come out this past spring to Lexington to tour the green and talk about that, but never made any connection with the uh, local um, historical society, which has been doing the work which I've been working with to present the black history of Lexington during that time period. And so none of that material was in the, 
the class that was being presented to this whole group of students. It was probably about 50 or 60 students. And so, you know, um, how do you get to reach out and also to reach out in a way that puts aside the concerns that these communities have from their long experience of working or trying to work with the university? Yep. Well, first off, they're very fair criticisms. And and it's my guess that that Harvard as an institution may continue to misstep when it comes to being out in the community. What I will say is that a fundamental piece of what we are trying to do with HNLS is through lots of conversation is just build trust to get people to realize that we are not presupposing the answers. We are approaching this work with humility and that we are not trying to take over efforts that are already underway, but it's going to take some time for people to trust us. You know, there are opportunities I've had to talk with different groups and often people come at me hot with a lot of what you're saying less diplomatically and they're totally fair criticisms. And what I've experienced for the most part is by the end, we're having a nice conversation and it's really productive and collaborative, but there's a lot of pent up frustration. Harvard hasn't been the best neighbor. And I think we have to you know, acknowledge it, call a spade a spade, acknowledge also that HNLS is one piece of a very large university and we don't control all aspects of it, um, but also recognize that we have a new president who is extremely committed to this work, who is invested in identifying leaders across the university who can also help carry it out. And so we hope, number one, that if we misstep, someone brings it to our attention so we can at the very least apologize and if not, make it better. But then number two, that I hope that as we build this trust, that folks can give us a little bit of grace um, because we're not gonna be perfect and we will try our hardest, but we are not gonna be perfect. Does that help at all? Yes, thank you. I think that your approach and your um, comments are uh, very much in line with what I'm talking about. And I think you're a good person to be in the head of this initiative. I, I hope, I wish you the best. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, Paula, Paula, I have a question which has been burning since I walked the tour. All right, Dan, I'm gonna pull you in. Um, conducted um, by the three Harvard Square churches as we were standing in front of the building named after Elizabeth Agassi, which houses the admissions office. There were other quote unquote regular tours for prospective students. How will HNLS be incorporated into these tours so it is not on a parallel track? I'm, I, do you wanna take it first, Dan, or should I take it? Why don't you start and I'll, I'll add if necessary. Okay, great. So first off, it's a great point. One thing that we are trying to do with this initiative is to make sure that every student who comes through our gates has some base familiarity with the top lines that we talked about from the report. Why? Because if you are fortunate enough to come to Harvard, chances are you are going to do well. We want our graduates to also do good because they are armed with this knowledge. And so one thing we have done is we have added orientation materials about HNLS across all of the schools. So everyone's getting exposure to it. One thing we want to do, to your point, Barbara, is to think about, you know, the tours is a huge public facing thing for the university, not just the HNLS tours, but the general tours. Are there pieces of the HNLS tour that we can get incorporated into the main tour? So it's a work in progress. You know, once we have the memorial, which is a few years, several years out, that's another way to think about integrating this into how people are introduced to the university, but it's an excellent question and one for which the answer is not totally clear at this point. What would you add, Dan? Um, thank you. And thank you, Paula, for the, the question. I'd, I'd just like to comment on the work in progress. The tour itself is a work in progress and um, some of you have had a chance to, to take it. Um, it's been in a pilot mode this last year and the tours now are, are kind of being held under the auspices of the Harvard and Legacy of Slavery Initiative. Last year it was under the Office of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Belonging. And we're grateful for the support of, um, of this. This is led by chaplains at Harvard to really kind of slow down the intake of all of the material and give people a chance to really um, feel the weight of it in their bodies um, around campus as we experience um, some of this history together. And that takes time. 
there have been 10 tours scheduled sort of each semester, and there seems to be real appetite. Um, and the question on the parallel track, I think that is um, one that now that now that the tour has kind of taken a hold for itself is an ongoing conversation. And I know that um, staff at HLNS are already reaching out to staff at the you know broader tour offices to set up meetings. But this is, as um, Sarah rightly noted, we are just getting started. And yet I imagine that down the road a year from now, we're going to be so much farther from where we were last year. We were just like, is this tour? Will, will this even work? And now, you know, hundreds of students, faculty, staff at Harvard, and some people in the community have, have taken it. So um, thanks. I don't want to take more time now, but um, just echoing the work in progress and um, the, we're just getting started. I should also say, yes, yeah. thank you. There was a typo in the slide before. Um, it's Tracy K. Smith and Dan Byers who are leading the memorial committee, not um, uh, Tracy Byers and Dan Smith. Um, that, I'm doing other work with this and in the community at First Church, as you know, from other calls, um, sort of wearing different hats on different meetings. But that is not a hat that I'm wearing um, for the memorial committee. Thank you for clarifying, Dan, and apologies uh, for the typo. That was my fault. I, if I may, I would love to ask you all a question, which is, and just feel free to come off mute and respond, but I would love to hear what you're hearing about this report, about the initiative, if anything, negative or positive. It'd be very helpful to know that from your perspective. Yeah, Barbara. Um, I'm hearing nothing. Okay. Um, except that Harvard has acknowledged it and Harvard has put some money behind it. Um, and when I tell people about Thomas Perkins and their, uh, the Perkins family, there are three pages in your legacy report about the Perkins family. Um, that is one easy way to put that into the regular tours. Harvard um, made its got huge donations in the early 19th century that separated it from all the other colleges in the United States. And those donations came from slave traders. Wham. You can pretty it up if you'd like. Your suggestion, Barbara, is to disseminate that knowledge. I'm suggesting that you could put that in, a, in the um, admissions tours. Oh, in the admissions tour. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, and I'm, I have a question that was a, a long question for everybody, which was on, I put in the chat. And so perhaps I'll leave that for another time. It's probably the first, an early question in the chat. It's about how to describe Thomas Perkins without pissing people off. My latest moniker for him is Thomas Perkins uh, enriched himself by destroying others, colon, slave trader and opium smuggler. And I've gotten a, a, a lot of negative feedback um, from whites saying, more or less, you've gone too far. Slave trader is a lot milder term. So I'm thinking about how do we keep up with making slave trading and slavery not just another word in our vocabulary of history. Thank you, and Barbara. So I'm wondering, should I use that or should I not? But it's also the bigger question, how do we make this real so that it gets to people's souls, not just information? Information is not it won't take us anywhere yeah right that's the key if, how do you change hearts and minds and if i, I may um yeah add add two cents um barbara i think that um your your comment is is interesting but i i don't think it should say that harvard got a lot of money in the 19th century because it began getting that money in the 17th century and I think the long view of how slavery and the slave trade enriched this country is what we're really looking at, not just how it enriched an institution or one community or another, but to make the recognition 
that slavery was is is part of the marrow of America, as it's been said, and that it moved lockstep with the country from its inception um, up through even the period that um, followed the legal ending of slavery. And so I think what we're each of these efforts is trying to do is to put that into the um, American narrative, the significance, the importance of slavery, the way it was um, utilized and wrapped around the founding fathers, as they call them. And it was also wrapped around the founders of all these institutions and towns in many ways, not only directly, but also indirectly from all those who made money investing in slavery through um, the um, textile industries or even directly investments through stock marketing and insurance and all of that. So I think that um, when we begin to put slavery into the perspective of American history, the American story, then the, the role of people like Thomas Perkins becomes very clear. And, and it's less about Thomas Perkins himself and about Thomas Perkins as part of this larger system of exploitation that helped build this country. Thank you, Robert. I know we have just a few minutes left and I wanna turn things back over to Egypt. Before I do, any other reflections or thoughts about what you're hearing, positive or negative, about HNLS in your community? Okay. I will just, oh yeah, Kate. I just wondered if you were connected at all with the work that has been done and is ongoing at the Royal House in Medford because um, I am in Medford and there's a lot of, it seems like it was like this little patch of awareness about Northern slavery for such a long time. And it's good to see the awareness spreading out from there, but that was literally where I learned that, oh my God, it, it existed in the North. Um, and I'm still very annoyed that I grew up in the Boston suburbs and I was taught that slavery was a Southern thing. Yeah, yeah. Still, that I, mm -hmm. yeah. So in terms of the Royal House is a great example of how, so everything that we've mostly talked about is what's happening centrally at Harvard but the Royal House and Slave Quarters in Medford is a great example of how parts of Harvard are really leaning into this work. So that whole initiative is being led by the law school and their dean is very committed um, both between recent investments in the Royal House and then thinking about you know, how to create a memorial, the Belinda Sutton Quadrangle on the law school campus. There's a lot of different things in the works and it's just a good example of you know, how do you, through the leadership of a school, lean in and try to really embrace the principles of this work. The one thing I would just say before turning it over to Egypt is stay tuned. We're going to have an annual report coming out in the spring on the anniversary. And so that'll be hopefully a good summary of everything that's been happening. Hopefully you can help share it and ask questions if you have them. And then again, that RFP that I mentioned will be coming out in the fall semester. The other thing to just keep an eye out for is for the memorial, we will be releasing what's called a request for qualifications also in the fall semester. That's an opportunity for architectural, it's, it's going to be totally public, architectural teams can um, submit and then a selected number will be invited to submit a full proposal. And so that process will also be underway. And so those are some of the things to stay tuned for. But just really, really thank you for your time, for your honesty, for your candor, really encourage you sincerely to reach out if you have questions or thoughts about things that we can do differently or better. And I will turn things back over to Egypt. Thank you again, Sarah. You know, your presentation today was wonderful and thank you for your time and giving us that update. It was very informative. Um, I would like to remind everyone um, again that next month um, on the 11th, we will have a Christian walk with the Museum of African American History who will be our presenter. And I wanted to say it's so good to see everyone. Thank you for your feedback and your engaging in today's presentation with Sarah to Dan, to uh, Dr. Bellinger, to Dr. Barbara Brown, um, for everyone that made the comments in the chat. And um, we look forward to seeing you guys next month. And just like Sarah said, if you have any more questions, feel free to email us. I will forward it to her. Um, 
and I'm sure she'll get back to you and again, Sarah, have a beautiful, beautiful birthday. And thank you everyone for joining us again. We look forward to seeing you guys next month. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care.